Hi guys, Lars here. I've uh, ridden up from Birmingham to Liverpool today to play the uh, International Pop Overthrow Festival at the legendary Cavern Club. I shall be playing the show with psychedelic mod band The Dream Factory. We're doing two shows today. Let's check it out. So we've uh, just played the uh, first set for the day on the what's now known as the, the main stage of the cavern. Mark Mortimer, bass player, and myself have come and uh, had a bit of a stroll near the docks with the beautiful liver building in the, the background. And the um, Mersey on the, on the other side. And the it? Mersey on the other side, yeah. And um, so I thought uh, I'd like to uh, have a nice chat with this man and he, he can um, fill me in on um, the origins of the Dream Factory and how it all started really, mate. So, yeah. um, well, uh, okay, so we're looking back to 82, 1982, and, um, you know, the name the Dream Factory came from a porn magazine. <laughs> uh, not mine, I hasten to add. <laughs> and uh, not that it matters, but it wasn't mine. Um, and it was my, me and my mate Donald who came up with the idea of the, of the band. Um, um, and we were kind of putting it together in Tamworth and Tim Tim had done a bit of singing with another band that came before us called Private Property and mm. so it was a kind of the next thing on from Private Property and so we called it the Dream Factory because it sounded psychedelic and the initial um, the initial plan for the band was to be doing British psychedelia with a twist and that's what we decided we wanted to do. So it was going to be this sort of psychedelic band, but Tim, Tim had his Paul and a jam thing going, and even then, so instantly the, there was a double twist, and that's how it all started. And um, you know, we we had our first demo in 1983, September 83, which we recorded in uh, somebody's house in Birchmore, a little village near Tamworth, and that was uh, for the track The Haze, and we did two other tunes as well. I want to tell you and remember me and that became like a little demo for us and it was great because I'd just become mates with Julian Cope and I, I very nervously played in the demo thinking oh, I was going to hate this, I was going to think it's crap and he was like this is really good, by the way who's the guitarist, he's amazing that's my mate Donald from school, he said well bring him round to see me so I did and that was the end of Donald he, Ended up playing with uh, Julian. The guitarist who replaced Donald was a guy called Lloyd from Polesworth. He came in and his mate Steve Quilton played drums, and that was the kind of classic lineup. Yeah. We added um, a guy called Andy Codling on sax, and we re that, that was the sort of lineup that really did the first record, Wine and Roses Fashion Toys, which we recorded in Hansworth in the studios. It was the Grosvenor Studios. That record came out in April. March, April uh, 2005. Yeah. 1985. 1985. <laughs> 1985. Oh my God. Yeah. And it did really well. You know, we picked up a lot of radio on airplay. Janice Long on radio and was pushing it. We had great reviews in the enemy, Melody Maker Sounds, all those sort of places. And it was really cooking on gas, to be honest. And we started getting a lot of scooter boys and mods of the time coming to follow us and we had this huge following and particularly in the Midlands they were die hard I yeah. mean they would you know turn up at gigs on scooters and camp overnight on the car park I, mean, I remember seeing this regularly by 80 early 86 Lloyd and Steve the drummer and Lloyd we we basically booted them out because right. it wasn't happening that's where Dave Stevenson came in. I, I knew Dave, he was in a band called Catch-22 from Atherston. Right. And they were like um, a poppier version of the mod thing that was around at the time. And Dave was like renowned locally as a really good guitar player. Uh, but he was only 14 or 15. He was wow. like stupidly <laughs> young. And I remember going to his house in Dorden and meeting his parents, you know. It was really odd actually having to meet the mum and dad because we were trying to 
get him to join our band and it all had to be done properly but he was great he was obviously a great musician so he was in on board we had a, a, a drummer called Andy Holt his nickname was Batman locally so Batman joined us <laughs> and then we at that point we in, introduced a, a horn section so that was yeah. the first time a proper section came about what brought on the kind of the hiatus of the decided to go we'll, we'll, we'll kind of knock this on the head for now or well the vibe we we pushed it so far and we, we were getting lots of national attention and at one point a label a, a really big indie label had come to see us and they asked us to do, asked us to do a gig for them like an audition gig and we did it in this in this tiny studio in town with expresso bongo and it was the best we'd ever played at that point. We were at the best of our abilities at that stage in the 80s. We played really well and they loved us. And they said, well, you know, after we went for a pint at a Castle Hotel in Tamworth and they were saying, we really love what you're doing. It's really ace, but there's one other band that we're really coming and ahhing about as well. Yeah. And we're not sure, we can't sign both of you. Ah. <laughs> it's, it's you or them, so give us a few weeks. And it wasn't us, it was the Stone Roses they picked. Ah, oh, right, okay. And they yeah. made the right decision because they were, they, they were doing something that was fresh. And, yeah, and at, at, at that stage, that really got me thinking. So I, so I told them, you know, I, I think it's time to knock it on the head. And our last gig in town with Tim punched me in the face on stage. <laughs> as like retribution. Wow. It's like, <laughs> but it was no bad thing. I completely no. understood. I was like, that's okay, I understand. For years, people have been asking us in the town with area, oh, get back together, you know. Do a one-off gig, and I, I was—I've always been quite into the idea, but I never wanted to get back together just for nostalgia's sake. Yeah, I, I, I'm not really into nostalgia, and I, and I don't think it was a good thing to get back together just to do old songs. Right. Okay. You know, so for me, if you're going to get back together, okay, it's a bit of fun, but actually do something that's worthwhile as well. If you're not doing something new and pushing forward, I'm not interested. Really. Yeah. You know, that's just the way I am. I shall uh, get together with Dave in a bit and get his his side of the event and uh, the end of the era for him and the beginning of the new one which I'm involved with. In the meantime we'll get back to our second set and um, I'll have a, a little look around Liverpool. With my buddy uh, Dave here. Hello. Um, we had a good gig earlier, didn't we? Um, yeah, fantastic. This is Mr. Dave Stevenson, guitarist for the Dream Factory. I also know him through playing through other bands. He is the reason why I grace the stage <laughs> with the Dream Factory. I had a chat with Mark earlier. It was great. A nice little bit of insight into how the band started. And that. Great. So, from your point of view, uh, what was it like joining the band and? Uh, what were the shenanigans? <laughs> well, it's really exciting, uh, Lars, because um, at the time that I joined the Dream Factory, they were the, by far the biggest local band around, really. And the, there's a lot of excitement in the, around the band, and they were on the cusp of making it. And uh, about a year before they, um, I joined the band, they'd released Wine and Roses and, and had uh, fantastic success with that locally. And uh, in fact, ironically, we I was a fan of the band before I joined, you know, quite a big fan, really. Yeah. And we've been playing um, Wine and Roses at my school um, radio station. Uh, Every every lunchtime we'd go and uh, have a lunch and then um, have a, a radio station session and we played these vinyl records and Wine and Roses was one of them really every every, every lunchtime they got played on the school radio so uh, and I'd seen them um, at a couple of shows as well and there was uh, you know uh, lots of uh, excitement around the band and um, I, I'd been playing guitar for a few years and uh, in fact uh, Mark's girlfriend at the time uh, her brother recommended me to the band and what happened was um, they, there's a uh, there's a bit of a fallout, and uh, the guitarist at the time and the drummer left. Yeah. And they lived. They actually lived in the village where I, I, I grew up in and was born in. And uh, uh, my friend uh, recom from school recommended me. So I was actually 14 at the time. So <laughs> obviously Mark and Tim are a few years older than me, and but um, I was still uh, you know, just out of short trousers really. So and um, I've been playing in a school a school band, um, but this was a really big thing for me. So very excited to join the band, and it was great, you know. And we were playing good gigs, and um, you know, to, to join a name band at that time, uh, at that age, uh, and at the point where they were on the cusp of uh, pretty much making it, you know, it's a it's a great time to be involved with it, really. Fantastic.
fantastic. And so how does it feel at the stage now? Mark said to me that um, when it came to reforming this time, uh, he was really adamant that it wasn't just a reform. He yeah. wanted to move forward and write stuff. What, what's your thoughts on where it is now? And Absolutely. What, what that, yeah, I really didn't want it to be a nostalgia trip, uh, and I think that was really important to me. That, and also to protect the legacy of the band because the band was very well thought of when uh, when we split, and we split at uh, the time, the right time for the band because. Um, uh, uh, it, it was clearly we weren't going to make it I don't think beyond that because times have changed now um, so it was really important to protect the legacy of the band and uh, and also for it not to be just like a, a greatest hits thing and a nostalgia trip and I, I, I never really felt that nostalgic about it or the need to go back to it really um, and so uh, writing new material is absolutely the essence of the band so so um, it, I suppose uh, rehashing some of the originals and uh, kind of giving them a, a more modern twist mm. and then absolutely writing new material and, and Tim uh, Mark and I have had some great writing sessions together and um, we've, we've had a, a couple of uh, tracks we played today uh, not like yesterday things we left and said came out yeah. of the sessions but we've got some more in the pipeline as well so yeah. um, over the next few months that's really where it's going to be at for me is um, uh, bringing new material yeah. into the Dream Factory show Great, well just to let everyone know um, we've been recording a new EP um, over the last couple of months um, what are your thoughts on the tracks that are on there, the the ones that obviously connect to the heyday yeah. and moving forwards? What do you feel about the EP and, and its launch and what it will do for us? Yeah, really? yeah. Well, I, I think the first thing is that, that I mentioned that we've got a fantastic new lineup really, and that the new band is by far better than the, the, the old lineup ever was. Mm-hmm. Although we had you know some great musicians back in the day, uh, the new band is something else really, and, and a, a bunch of friends really, I think as yeah. well. So there's a great camaraderie there. Um, but in terms of the the EP I think we've got a good balance of some of the best of the tracks that we didn't release back in the day uh, and also the best of our new material so it, it's got hopefully something for everybody there really so um, it, it's, it's got some, some songs that people know and uh, recognise us for but equally some fresh stuff really and uh, which I hope people like you know yeah definitely well as I say it's always great talking to you yeah, Dave. Like, like, like. and um, yeah so let's head back to the cavern and uh, get rocking shall we I can't wait <laughs> next show <laughs> So I'm back at the bike, ready to head back to Birmingham. It's been two really good sets with the Dream Factory tonight. It was really great to uh, speak to Mark Mortimer and uh, Dave Stevenson about the history of the band. It's the first time I've actually properly spoken to them about it. So I learned some new things myself today. Once again, it was great to play the cavern and uh, jump back on the bike and head back to Birmingham.